Now, on HistoryRadio.org, John Buchan's description of the end of hostilities in 1918. The destruction of the Siegfried defences broke the nerve of the German high command, and when Ludendorff began to waver, it was inevitable that the civilian statesmen should follow suit. The German people were dumbly determined that somehow or other the war should end before the winter. If the army was to be saved, by hook or by crook, a way must be found to suspend hostilities, for every day made it clearer that retreat to a line of assured defence was beyond its power. Accordingly, the high command bade the politicians quicken the pace of their negotiations and, discarding their old line of argument, beg, unequivocally, for an armistice. They were well aware that such a step would go far to wreck the moral of the troops, but they had no other choice. On 5th of October, the note was sent to President Wilson, the draft of which had been prepared by Ludendorff, asking him to take in hand the restoration of peace and to invite the Allies to send plenipotentiaries to open negotiations. He announced that Germany accepted the President's proposals set forth in his message to Congress of January 8, 1918, and in his later pronouncements as a basis for the discussion of peace terms. In order to prevent further bloodshed, he asked for the conclusion of an immediate armistice on land and water and in the air. On 8 October, Mr. Wilson replied, he announced that America could not propose to her allies a cessation of hostilities so long as the armies of the Central Powers were upon Allied soil. As a guarantee of good faith, there must first be withdrawal from invaded territory. Germany made haste to answer, for by 12 October, the date of the reply, the last remnants of the Siegfried Zone had gone. Their reply stated that Germany and Austria were willing to evacuate invaded territory as a preliminary to an armistice and suggested a mixed commission to make the necessary arrangements. Small wonder that Germany assented. To get her troops back intact to her frontier was her dearest wish. She was in truth offering nothing and asking everything. There was nothing to prevent Germany, once safe inside her frontiers, from breaking off negotiations and instituting war on a new plan. It was clear that if an armistice came it must be one which was equivalent to surrender. On 14th of October, Mr. Wilson made his reply, and there was no dubiety about the terms. It must be clearly understood that the process of evacuation and the conditions of an armistice are matters which must be left to the judgment and advice of the military advisers. The President feels it his duty to say that no arrangement can be accepted by the government of the United States which does not provide absolutely satisfactory safeguards and guarantees of the maintenance of the present military supremacy of the armies of the United States and of the allies in the field. This was final. Foch, Haig and Pershing were not likely to fling away the predominance which was now assured to them. The history of events runs now in two parallel streams, one of diplomacy and one of war. By the evening of 10th October, Haig was in the western skirts of Le Cateau, and our troops held the very slopes where in August 1914 Smith Dorian had fought his great battle against odds, and bluffed Cluck at a moment when that general had victory in his hands. On the 17th, it was found that Ostend had been evacuated, and on the same day, it was reported by our airmen that the enemy was retiring from Lille and had sent out some thousands of civilians towards our lines. A patrol entered the city, to be received with frenzied joy by the inhabitants. Next day, Lille was occupied by our troops, and the 15th Corps pressed on to the east, taking Roubaix and Tourcoing. The capital of the northeast was restored to France, and its statue in the Place de la Concorde could once again be garlanded with flowers.
The progress of that week was not less conspicuous, farther south. By 23rd October, the Allied centre and left were everywhere in open country and facing hastily prepared field defences. But in the south, the French and Pershing had still to carry the final system, fortified on the old enemy plan. The problem before Pershing had now become the most difficult of that of any army commander. The German position in the Argonne was nearly invulnerable to frontal attack, and the plan of pressing forward on both sides of the wooded ridge was foreseen by the enemy and made difficult by prepared defences of the greatest strength and the intractable nature of the terrain. The American First Army was given a task like the British at the Battle of the Somme, and, like the British, suffered from its lack of experience and its too audacious gallantry. It had not yet learned, as the commands of Haig and Pétain had learned, caution and wiliness by bitter experience. Pershing's front of 18 miles between the Meuse and the Argonne was miserably supplied with roads, one along the Meuse, one on the edge of the Argonne, one by Montfaucon in the centre, all bad, and too much exposed to enemy fire. The finest transport system in the world must have broken down under such handicaps. But for the engineers to construct a new road system meant delay, and the problem was therefore that if the war was not to drag into 1919, the splendid fighting stuff of the American infantry must be used in spite of all disadvantages. It was a bold decision for the commander to take, but it was essentially wise and it was a decisive factor in victory. But the price paid was high. By 28th of September, the Americans had penetrated seven miles inside the enemy's lines. It took them 11 days to advance two miles more. They were now in direct contact with the Kriemhilde system, and the attack of 14th October failed to break it. When the second phase of Pershing's attack closed on 31st October, the last Kriemhilde position had not been taken. The American First Army had fought a new wilderness campaign which may well rank for valour and tenacity with the old. Against Haig, now approaching the Mormal Forest, the other great German defensive effort was made. The weather was bad, and the misty air made it hard to locate enemy batteries, while the undevastated woods and hamlets gave endless chances for machine gun resistance. The Mormal Forest, too, afforded a perfect screen for counterattacks. Yet in two days the British 4th, 3rd and 1st Armies advanced six miles. The condition of Ludendorff's forces was becoming tragic. If those of the Allies were tired, his were in the last stages of fatigue. On 21st March he had possessed a reserve of 80 fresh divisions, and during April, May and June divisions were not sent back to the line without at least a month of rest and training. On 31st October he had but one fresh division, and the intervals of rest had shrunk to nine days far too short to permit of recovery. Moreover, these wearied units were returned to the front without being brought up to strength, and divisions entered the line numbering less than 1,000 rifles. Ludendorff was fighting with the fury of despair to delay his retirement so that he might move his vast quantities of material and consequently he could give his broken troops no rest. The result was that their discipline was breaking and the whole enemy morale was on the brink of collapse. Prodigies of gallantry and sacrifice were performed by the remnants of the old officer class, and notably by the machine gunners. But no valour could prevail against overmastering physical weakness. To make matters worse, it was clear that there was no city of refuge in the shape of a shorter line to which he could retreat and find a breathing space. The muse was already turned, it needed but a final bound to set the Americans astride the Metz railway. With Haig pressing fiercely in on the centre, it was inevitable that the retreat would be largely shepherded northward with appalling losses, into the gap of Liège. And there, on the scene of her worst infamies, Germany would meet her fate. The men who had outraged Belgium were mostly dead in dishonoured graves, but justice would be done upon their haggard successors. The shadow of a far more terrible sedan brooded over the proud German high command. In such circumstances, it was small wonder that Germany strove feverishly for peace. She flung dignity to the winds, blasphemed her old gods, and recanted with indecent haste her former creeds, not as a penitent, but as a criminal who stands condemned and seeks to ingratiate himself with his judges. On 20th October a second note was addressed to Mr. Wilson, agreeing to leave the conditions of armistice to the military advisers of both sides and to accept the present relative strength on the fronts as the basis of arrangement. Trusting to the President to approve no demand, irreconcilable with the honour of the German people. On 23rd October, Mr. Wilson replied, 
His answer left no loophole of escape. In effect, it demanded the abdication of the emperor and the destruction of all for which he had stood. It asked that the great general staff should be deposed from their autocracy and placed under civilian control. It declined to treat save with new men bearing a popular mandate. To accept these demands was tantamount to an admission of final defeat in the field. Germany accepted them on 27th October, declaring that peace negotiations would be conducted by a people's government to which the military powers were subject. On Saturday, 26th October, Ludendorff resigned. Few friends now remained to him. The German people at large saw in his military dictatorship of the past two years the cause of their misfortunes. And especially they blamed him for the rash optimism which had led to the March Offensive, while the reactionaries reprobated him as the originator of the first armistice proposals, which had taken the heart out of the army. Upon Ludendorff and his world the twilight of the gods was falling. In the wild legends of the northern races, the shades of the dead appeared to those on the brink of doom, and the heavens were filled with the shield maidens riding to choose the slain. The superstitious among Germany's rulers had in those days the spectacle of many portents to convince them of approaching calamity. Everywhere the wheel was coming full circle. The Belgians were approaching the dark land where each village spoke of German crimes. The British were almost within sight of the region where they had first met the enemy, swinging south, as he thought, to victory before the leaves fell. The French and the Americans had but a little way to go till their eyes beheld the wooded hills of Sedan. The alliances of which Germany had boasted were now utterly dissolved. More ominous still, that Eastern Europe, which had seen her most spectacular triumphs, was like to prove her worst undoing. The poison of Bolshevism, with which she had sought to inoculate her opponents, was beginning to creep into her own veins. Whatever crimes she had committed in the long war were now blossoming to her hurt. Ludendorff had gone, and the Supreme Command was in commission. Foch was on the eve of his last step. Pershing and Gouraud advanced to cut the metz montmedy mezieres line and limit the avenue of German retreat. Haig took Valenciennes and pushed on down the Sambre towards Namur. On Tuesday 5th November, the enemy's resistance was finally broken. Henceforth, he was not in retreat, but in flight. Moreover, Foch had still his trump card to play, the encircling swing of his right by way of Metz to close the last way of escape. If a negotiated armistice did not come within a week, there would be a de facto armistice of complete collapse and universal surrender. During that week in Germany, the mutterings of the storm of revolution were growing louder. Some issued heated appeals for a patriotic closing up of ranks in a last stand against the coming disaster. Others attempted to make a scapegoat of the fallen Ludendorff, and everywhere was apparent a rising anger against the imperial house. The emperor had fled to the army, but the army was in no case to protect him. Everywhere there reigned a frantic fear of invasion, especially in Bavaria, where the collapse of Austria made the populace expect to see at any moment the victorious Italians in their streets. And invasion was no cheerful prospect to Germany, when she remembered her own method of conducting it, and reflected that for four years she had been devastating the lands and dragooning the peoples of the powers marching to her borders. Strange things, too, were happening within her own confines. In the first days of November, the stage had been set for a great sea battle. Her high sea fleet was ordered out, but it would not move. The dry rot, which had been growing during the four years in action, had crumbled all its discipline. Der Tag had come, but not that joyous day which her naval officers had toasted. She had broken the unwritten laws of the deep sea, and she was now to have her reward. On 4th November, the red flag was hoisted on the battleship Kaiser. The mutiny spread to the Kiel shipyards and workshops, where there had always been a strong socialist element. A council of soldiers, sailors and workmen was formed, and the mutineers captured the barracks and took possession of the town. The trouble ran like wildfire to Hamburg, Bremen, Lübeck, and adjacent ports, and it was significant that in every case the soldiers and sailors took the lead. Deputations of social democrats were sent down post-haste by the government and succeeded in temporarily restoring order. But the terms on which peace was made were the ruin of the old regime. In Cologne, in Essen, and in other industrial centres, there were grave disturbances, and everywhere the chief outcry was against the emperor and the Hohenzollerns. 
he who had been worshipped as a god because he was the embodiment of a greater Germany, was now reviled by a nation disillusioned of dreams of greatness. At the same time, the empire was dissolving at its periphery. The Polish deputies from Posen and Silesia seceded from the Reichstag, and Schleswig demanded liberation. It was hard to tell where in Germany now lay the seat of power. On the 5th, the army command invited to headquarters representatives of the majority parties in the Reichstag to discuss the next step, and search was made for military officers who might be least unacceptable to the Allies. On that day, the government at Washington transmitted to Germany through Switzerland the last word on the matter of negotiations. This note gave the reply of America's allies to the correspondence which had been formally submitted to them. They had accepted the President's 14 points as a basis on which they were willing to negotiate peace, with two provisos. First, they reserved their own liberty of action on the question of the freedom of the seas, since that phrase was open to so many interpretations. Second, by the word restoration in the case of invaded territories, they declared that they understood compensation by Germany for all damage done to the civilian population of the Allies and to their property, by the aggression of Germany by land, by sea, and from the air. Mr. Wilson signified his assent to these provisos and announced that Marshal Foch had been authorised by all the Allies to receive properly accredited representatives of the German government and to communicate to them the terms of an armistice. At the front during those last days, the weather was wet and chilly, very different from the bright August when British troops had last fought in that region. The old regular forces which had then taken the shock of Germany's first fury had mostly disappeared. Many were dead or prisoners or crippled for life, and the rest had been dispersed through the whole British army. The famous first five divisions of the retreat from Mons were in the main new men but some were there who had fought steadily from the Sambre to the Marne, and back again to the Eisne, and then for four years in bitter trench battles, and who now returned after our patient fashion to their old campaigning ground. Even the slow imagination of the British soldier must have been stirred by that strange revisiting. He was approaching places which in 1914 had been no more than names to him. Half-understood names heard dimly in the confusion of a great retreat but some stood out in his memory. The fortress of Maubeuge, on which France had set such store. Above all, the smoky coal pits of Mons, which had become linked forever in the world's mind with the old contemptibles. Then he had been marching south in stout-hearted bewilderment, with the German cavalry pricking at his flanks. Now he was sweeping to the northeast on the road to Germany, and far ahead his own cavalry and cyclists were harassing the enemy route, while on all the packed roads his airmen were scattering death. On the night of the 7th, the line of the Scheldt broke, and on the 9th the guards entered Maubeuge, while the Canadians were sweeping along the Condé Canal towards Mons. Next day the Belgians had Ghent. In the south, the Allied advance was even more rapid. Indeed, the record of places captured had become meaningless. These were feverish days, both for the victors and the vanquished. Surrender hung in the air, and there was a generous rivalry among the Allies to get as far forward as possible before it came. This was specially noted among the British troops who wished to finish the war on the ground where they had started. Take as an instance the 8th Division in Horney's First Army. It had spent the winter in the Ypres salient. It had done gloriously in the retreat from St. Quentin. It had fought in the Third Battle of the Aisne. And from the early days of August, it had been hotly engaged in the British advance. Yet now it had the vigour of the first month of war. On the 10th of November one of its battalions, the 2nd Middlesex, travelled for seven hours in buses and then marched 27 miles, pushing the enemy before them. They wanted to reach the spot near Mons, where some of them, then in the 4th Middlesex, fired almost the first British shots in the war, and it is pleasant to record that they succeeded. Likewise, the 2nd Royal Irish, who had fought with the 3rd Division in the loop of the canal northeast of Mons on August 26, 1914, were with the 63rd Division entering the same loop on the last day of war. Meantime, in Germany, the conventions which for generations had held her civilian people was patently dissolving. There were few mutinies like that of the northern ports. The old authorities simply disappeared, quietly, unobtrusively, and the official machine went on working without them. 
Kings and courts tumbled down, and the various brands of socialists met together, gave themselves new names, and assumed office. There was as yet nothing which approached a true revolution, nothing which involved a change of spirit. Deep down in the ranks of the people there was a dull anger and disquiet, but for the moment it did not show itself in action. They stood looking on while the new men shuffled the old cards. But it was essential for Germany to get rid of the signposts of the old regime. Bavaria took the lead, and on Friday the 8th, a meeting of a workmen's and soldiers' council, under the leadership of a Polish Jew, Kurt Eisner, decreed the abolition of the Wittersbach dynasty. In Frankfurt, Cologne, Leipzig, Bremen, Hanover, Augsburg, and elsewhere, similar councils were formed, who took upon themselves the preservation of order and declared that they held their power in trust for the coming German Socialist Republic. So far there had been few signs of despotic class demands on the Russian model. In most places, the change was made decently and smoothly. Saturday the 9th saw the crowning act in the capital. Bands of soldiers and enormous assemblies of workmen patrolled the streets, singing Republican songs. There was a little shooting and a certain number of windows were broken. Soldiers flung away their badges and iron crosses. Everywhere the royal arms were torn down and red flags fluttered from the balcony of the imperial palace. Whence, in the first week of August 1914, the emperor had addressed his loyal people. Yet orderly as was the first stage in Germany's revolution, and strenuous as were the efforts made to provide administrative continuity. On one side, the revulsion was complete. The old absolutism was gone, and monarchy within the confines of Germany had become a farce. Hated in some regions, in all despised as an empty survival. For centuries the pretensions of German kinglets had made sport for Europe. Now these kinglets disappeared, leaving no trace behind them. In Bavaria, Saxony, Württemberg, the Mecklenburgs, Hesse, Brunswick, Baden, the dynasties fell with scarcely a protesting voice. With the lesser fell the greater. On Saturday the 9th it was announced that the emperor had decided to abdicate and that the imperial crown prince renounced the succession. With a revolution behind him and his conquerors before him, there was no place left for him in the world. He did not stand upon the order of his going. On Sunday the 10th, he left main headquarters at Spa, crossed the Dutch frontier, and sought refuge in the house of Count Bentinck at Amerongen. Prince Ruprecht retired to Brussels to await the victors, and the imperial crown prince fled from his armies, and like his father found sanctuary in Holland. History has not often recorded a fall from greater heights to greater depths, the man who had claimed to be the vicegerent of God on earth, and had arrogated to himself a power little short of the divine, now stole from the stage like a discredited player. Other kings and leaders who have failed have gone down dramatically in the ruin they made, but this actor of many parts had not the chance of such an exit. His light emotional mind and his perverse vanity had plagued the world for a generation, and had now undone the patient work of the builders of Germany. Tragic, indeed, was the cataclysm of German hopes and tragic, but in a lesser sense, was the fall of William II, King of Prussia, Margrave of Brandenburg, and Count of Hohenzollern. Like Lucian's Peregrinus, his life had been dominated by a passion for notoriety. But unlike that ancient charlatan, he could not round off his antics on a public pyre. In fleeing from his country he did the best he could for his country's interests, and no humane man will wish to exult over the spectacle of broken pride and shattered dreams. In such an end, his Ivris had received the most terrible of retributions. The German delegates, who left Berlin on the afternoon of Wednesday the 6th, arrived in the French lines at 10 o'clock on the Thursday night, and were given quarters in the chateau of the Marquis de L'Aigle at Francport, near choisy au -Bac. On Friday morning, they presented themselves at the train in the forest of Compiègne, which contained Marshal Foch and Sir Roslyn Wemis. The French marshal asked, Qu'est-ce que vous désirez, monsieur? and they replied that they had come to receive the Allied proposals for an armistice. To this, Foch answered that the Allies did not propose any armistice, but were content to finish the war in the field. The delegates looked nonplussed and stammered something about the urgent need for the cessation of hostilities. Ah, said Foch, I understand, you have come to seek an armistice. Von Gundel and his colleagues admitted the correction, 
and explicitly asked for an armistice. They were then presented with the Allied terms and withdrew to consider them after being informed that they must be accepted or refused within 72 hours. That is to say, before 11 o'clock on the morning of Monday the 11th. They asked for a provisional suspension of hostilities, a request which Foch curtly declined. The terms were telephoned to Berlin and a conference of the new government was held that morning. The hours of grace were fast slipping away and Foch was adamant about the time limit. The delegates were instructed to accept and after a protest they submitted to the inevitable. The terms were so framed as to give full effect to the victory on land and sea which the Allies had won. All invaded territory, including Alsace-Lorraine, was to be immediately evacuated and the inhabitants repatriated. Germany was to surrender a large amount of war material, specified under different classes. The Allies were to take control of the left bank of the Rhine and of three bridgeheads on the right bank in the Cologne, Koblenz and Mainz districts. And a neutral zone was to be established all along that bank between Switzerland and the Dutch frontier. A great number of locomotives and other forms of transport were to be immediately delivered to the Allies. All Allied prisoners of war were to be repatriated forthwith but not so German prisoners in Allied hands. German troops in Russia, Romania and Turkey were to withdraw within the frontiers of Germany, as these existed before the war. The treaties of Brest-Litovsk and Bucharest were cancelled. German troops operating in East Africa were to evacuate the country within one month. All submarines were to repair to certain specified ports and be surrendered. Certain units of the German fleet were to be handed over to the charge of the Allies and the rest to be concentrated in specified German ports, disarmed and placed under Allied surveillance, the Allies reserving the right to occupy Heligoland to enforce these terms. The existing blockade was to be maintained. Such were the main provisions, and the duration of the armistice was fixed at 36 days, with an option to extend. If Germany failed to carry out any of the clauses, the agreement could be annulled on 48 hours' notice. The acceptance of such terms meant the surrender of Germany to the will of the Allies, for they stripped from her the power of continuing or of renewing the war. It is necessary to be clear as to the exact significance of the terms of capitulation, for strange conditions have since been read into them by critics of Allied policy. These terms meant precisely what they said, so much and no more. Mr Wilson's fourteen points were not a part of them. The armistice had no connection with any later treaties of peace. It may be argued with justice that the negotiations by the various governments between 5th October and 5th November involved a declaration of principles by the Allies, which they were morally bound to observe in the ultimate settlement. But such a declaration bore no relation to the armistice. That was an affair between soldiers, a thing sought by Germany under the pressure of dire necessity to avoid the utter destruction of her armed manhood. It would have come about, though Mr Wilson had never indicted a single note, in the field, since 15th June, Germany had lost to British armies 188,700 prisoners and 2,140 guns, to the French 139,000 prisoners and 1,880 guns, to the Americans 44,000 prisoners and 1,121 guns, to the Belgians 14,500 prisoners and 474 guns. In the field, because she could not do otherwise, she made full and absolute surrender. In the fog and chill of Monday morning, 11th November, the minutes passed slowly along the front. An occasional shot, an occasional burst of firing, told that peace was not yet. Officers had their watches in their hands, and the troops waited with the same grave composure with which they had fought. At two minutes to eleven, opposite the South African Brigade, which represented the easternmost point reached by the British armies, a German machine gunner, after firing off a belt without pause, was seen to stand up beside his weapon, take off his helmet, bow, and then walk slowly to the rear. Suddenly, as the watch hands touched eleven, there came a second of expectant silence, and then a curious rippling sound, which observers far behind the front likened to the noise of a light wind. It was the sound of men cheering from the Vosges to the sea. After that peace descended on the long battlefield, a new era had come, and the old world had passed away. The military terms of the armistice were intended to prevent any German army again taking the field. The two main means to this end were the surrender by the enemy of military equipment 
and the occupation by the allies of three bridgeheads on the Rhine. The first proceeded slowly and laboriously, as such things must, for the German machine was in dire disorder. The second advanced with steady precision. At first the German retirement beyond the Rhine was chaos, confused columns a hundred miles long of stragglers of every arm. Then discipline reasserted itself, and the last part of the retreat was conducted in good order. The defeated armies of Germany marched into their cities with bands playing and flags flying, and there was some attempt made to prepare for them a popular reception. No one dare grudge the effort of a conquered enemy to put a brave complexion on defeat, and those troops deserved a welcome, for they had fought with unsurpassed courage and resolution. But with the Allies following at their heels, it was hard to build up the legend that Germany had not suffered defeat in the field. If proof were needed, it was to be found in the condition of the hinterland of the old German front. Every road was littered with abandoned tractors, lorries and tanks. Every line was blocked with loaded trucks and every canal with barges. Everywhere there were huge dumps of war material which could neither be used nor removed. Of the three great bridgeheads, the northern, that of Cologne and Bonn, was to be occupied by the British troops, the central at Koblenz by the Americans, and the southern at Mainz by the French. The full meaning of victory was scarcely realised by the Allied armies during the week in which they waited quietly in their lines. But when, early on the morning of Sunday 17th November, the advance began, there came a sudden awakening of all ranks to the tremendous thing that had been achieved. Names long heard of as German headquarters took concrete form as towns and villages. Rivers, which once seemed as remote as the moon, were left behind them, and daily they came nearer that mysterious land from which their enemy had issued. It was a grim business, for the joy of the liberated inhabitants could not disguise the horrors of the enemy occupation. And everywhere our advancing troops met strings of returning prisoners, dazed and emaciated men cast loose by the enemy to find their way back. Yet pride was the dominant note, and the troops swung out on the road to the Rhine with well-groomed horses, polished harness chains, spick-and-span guns and limbers, and every man smart and trim. The 19th was an historic date. The king and queen of the Belgians arrived at Antwerp, and that afternoon attended a te deum in the cathedral. Belgian troops had last left it on the night of October 9th, 1914, when smoke and flames made a pall as over some city of the Inferno. They returned to streets bright with flags and crowded with the cheering citizens whose days of torment were over. That day Mangin's 10th Army entered Metz an hour after noon. Pétain, now a Marshal of France, rode at the head of them. Every house flew the tricolour of the Republic, and the roadways were lined by young girls in the quaint costume of Lorraine. On Wednesday the 20th, the French reached the Rhine. Five days later, King Albert made his solemn entry into Brussels, the capital which he had abandoned in order to save his country. On the 23rd, the American Third Army advancing through Luxembourg crossed the German frontier. On Monday the 25th, the French entered Strasbourg, the most dramatic moment of all. Early in the afternoon came Pétain in his long cavalry cloak, for the day was chilly, and took his stand in front of the Imperial Palace in the Kaiserplatz. Beside him stood Gouraud, with his empty right sleeve, the most romantic figure among the great captains of France. And the three group commanders, Castelnau, Fayol, and Mestre. Then through the streets, where nearly every name was German and every flag was French, moved the men and guns of the Fourth Army. At first the occasion seemed too solemn for cheering, and there was little sound save from the drums and clarions of the regiments. But presently emotion broke forth, and the city became one voice around its deliverers. If we seek for a parallel in drama to the French entry into Strasbourg, we may find it in the passage of the Great River by the British Second Army. It took place on 13th of December in heavy rain, the weather in which most of their battles had been fought. Six months before, the British forces had been cooped up in a space of 45 miles between the enemy trenches and the Channel. Now they were 250 miles east of Bologna. All the marching tunes of the British Empire were heard in the rain, the Maple Leaf and the Men of Harlech, John Peel and Blue Bonnets. There was no parade, no gaudy triumph, but in the lean efficiency of the men the watching crowd read a grim lesson of power. The handful of British soldiers who had been present at the start of the contest in 1914 and who now witnessed the end of the long road may well have wavered in their minds between thankfulness and awe. 
for they were watching the consummation of a miracle, a miracle of patience, courage, and resolution. The little expeditionary force, small in numbers and small in the esteem of its opponents, had grown to almost the most formidable army that the world has seen. The words of Jacob might have been theirs. With my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. On Tuesday, 12th of November, the Allied fleets under Admiral Calthorpe passed through the Dardanelles, and on the morning of the 13th arrived off Constantinople. It was the fourth time in a century that a British fleet had entered the Sea of Marmara. Behind them, British and Indian troops garrisoned the Gallipoli forts, where so much good blood had been spilled in the enterprise at last concluded. The Black Sea was now under Allied control. At 2.30 in the afternoon of Friday 15th of November, the German light cruiser Königsberg arrived at Rosyth, bringing Admiral Hugo von Murrer to arrange for the carrying out of the armistice conditions. He brought with him three delegates from the Sailors' and Soldiers' Council, and three from the People's Council. Under the terms of surrender, all submarines were to be handed over. Ten battleships, six battlecruisers, eight light cruisers, and fifty destroyers. These were to be disarmed and interned in neutral ports, or failing that, in allied ports. But the neutral powers would have nothing to do with the business, so it fell to the Allies to receive them. The remaining surface warships left to Germany were to be concentrated in certain German ports, paid off and disarmed, and placed under the supervision of an Allied commission. The terms meant nothing less than the disappearance of German sea power. The conference between Admiral Beatty and Admiral von Murer came to an end late in the evening of the 16th. The affair was conducted with all the punctilios of naval etiquette, and the German admiral departed into the fog which clouded the Firth of Forth with such formal salutes as might have attended a visit of officers of one great fleet to another. The humiliation of Germany was too dire to need expression by word or ceremony. The fact shouted itself throughout all the world. On Wednesday the 20th the handing over of the submarines began. At a point 35 miles from the Essex coast, Admiral Sir Reginald Tyrwhitt, with five British light cruisers, received the surrender of the first 20 U-boats. It was a fine morning, with a quiet sea and the sun shining through the mist, when the British seamen saw the low grey hulls, escorted by German transports, coming from the east. Only one submarine flew the German ensign, and all had their numbers painted out. They were navigated by their own crews till close to Harwich, when British officers took charge, the white ensign was run up above the solitary German flag, and the German sailors embarked on their transports to go home. A grimmer scene could scarcely be conceived. The enemy craft were received in silence by the British cruisers, who had their men at action stations and their guns trained on the newcomers. There was no hint of fraternisation, scarcely a word was spoken, and the British sailors looked stolidly at the men who had disgraced their calling. A hiss or a taunt would have been less insulting than that deadly stillness. Next day, Thursday the 21st, in the same ominous quiet, the German battleships and battlecruisers were handed over to the custody of the British Grand Fleet, which was accompanied by detachments of the French and American navies. Sir David Beatty ordered the surrendered vessels to haul down their flags at 3.37 that afternoon and not to hoist them again without permission. In June 1914, a British squadron had been in Kiel Bay and British guns had hailed the final deepening of the Great Waterway. The Emperor had visited our flagship and the flag at her masthead had proclaimed the presence on board of an admiral of the British fleet. At a subsequent banquet, a German admiral had declared that his navy sought to model itself upon the great example of Nelson. Such is the mutability of mortal things. The German sea lords had disappeared into the darkness, and in a Dutch manner their master was waiting impotently while the Allies decreed his fate. The cessation of hostilities left Germany a seething cauldron of rival factions and immature theories, and it was hard to tell from the froth and bubbles of incipient revolution what might be the outcome. But one fact was clear. Monarchical Germany was gone. On 28th November, from his refuge in Holland, the Emperor issued his signed abdication. Fourteen days earlier, the Emperor Charles of Austria had bidden farewell to his uneasy throne. The old regime had disappeared in vapour. The old military chiefs had gone, and the decomposing armies were no longer in charge of princes. 
such was the immediate aftermath of war. Armistice Day was a big event. I can remember the first armistice, 1918. Well, on Armistice Day, my mother was hanging out the uh, the laundry, and it was a nice day, and uh, they didn't have electric dryers those days. I think she did the washing on a scrub scrub board. But she hung out the washing, and we were out with, I was out with her hanging up the washing, and the single uh, fire engine the city of Eugene had at that time was running up and down the streets with a siren blowing. And she didn't know why it was making so much noise, so she phoned my father downtown, at, and his phone number was 151 at the Eugene gun store. And I said, Arthur, what's going on? He says, gee, they just signed the armistice. and Everybody is celebrating. He said, you better come downtown. So my mother dressed, put me in my proper clothes, and we went downtown. And the interesting thing about that, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Men came to town with their shotguns. They went out of the store, they'd buy a box of sh shotgun shells. They'd go out in the street, middle of Willamette Street, load up the shotgun, and they would shoot the shotgun, of course, up in the air. Nobody got hurt, no, no injuries, there was no falling pellets, no falling lead. But well, that's the way the Eugenians celebrated Armistice Day on, in 1918, November 11th. You have just heard a reading of John Buchan's description of the end of hostilities in 1918. That was followed by the recollections of Herman P. Hendershot. The oral history interview was made by the Oregon Historical Society and released under a Creative Commons license. We willed it not. Wake up, England! Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. This is HistoryRadio.org, a free educational radio stream, remembering the First World War.